Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to this launch event on behalf of the European Policy Center and the Counter Extremism Project. Today, we're going to be presenting uh, and discussing, discussing um, the new EPC CEP discussion paper, which is entitled Hiding in Plain Sight, Disguised Compliance by Terrorist Defenders. Uh, this paper is co-authored by myself and my colleague uh, from CEP, Ian Atchison. The paper looks at how terrorist defenders engage in disguised compliance with the goal of making those professionals who are engaged in their de-radicalization uh, and rehabilitation um, believe that they are really de-radicalized and reformed characters, that they no longer believe the poisonous ideology that led them into terrorism in the first place. Unfortunately, in many cases, they are actually quite successful. I mean, the example that stands out for me is uh, Usman Khan, uh, the fishmonger's whole terrorist, um, is a case in question. Not only did he manage to fool those who were trying to help him, um, he actually sat chatting um, quite normally to the poor lady that he murdered around half an hour later. Um, and it, as it was revealed in a recent coroner's inquest, um, there was also a total failure to share crucial intelligence, which actually could have prevented this attack from happening. And this challenge uh, does not, of course, relate only to terrorist offenders. Sex offenders, child offenders, among others, also use uh, these same tactics and the same um, challenge um, exists. This is why it's so important um, that there is this ongoing exchange of information um, and good and bad practices uh, are vital when tackling this dangerous uh, phenomena. This is why EPC and CEP brought together uh, practitioners and experts on the issue for an expert change exchange earlier this year. Uh, and I'm happy that many of them are joining us today and many of their ideas are actually included in this publication. Um, so before I give the floor to my colleague from CEP, uh, Lucinda Crichton, I would just like to introduce the format of the event and our speakers. Um, first and foremost, as I just mentioned, Ian Atchison, who is a senior advisor at CEP uh, and a former prison governor. Um, we are then delighted to have a keynote speech um, from Olivier Onidi, who is Deputy Director General for Migration and Home Affairs at the European uh, Commission. Um, we are then gonna have um, a panel of what I would, would call our practitioners um, on this topic. Um, first of all, Sir Mark Rowley, who is a former head of the UK counter-terrorism policing uh, and a distinguished fellow at the Rusi think tank um, in London. Um, Gabby uh, Thiessen, who is a psychologist, um, high security and terrorist unit at Vught prison um, in the Netherlands. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we're joined today by Jim Gamble, who's founding chief executive of the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center, um, the In Inequa Safeguarding Group Commission. Um, to the audience, thank you very much for joining us today for what I hope is going to be a really interesting discussion. I hope you're going to have lots of questions and comments, and you can put these either by typing into the Q&A um, box or by raising or clicking on the hand icon, um, I should say. Um, but first of all, I want to hand now the floor to Lucinda. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Amanda, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm, obviously, I'm delighted uh, to be here to open this seminar on behalf of the Counter Extremism Project. Um, and I would begin by thanking our partners, EPC, uh, thanking you, the participants, and of course, thanking uh, our keynote speaker, Mr. Onidi, and also our esteemed panel members for taking the time to join us today. Um, the Counter Extremism Project, as some of you will be aware, is a non-profit and non-partisan international policy organization, which was formed to combat, combat the growing threat from extremist ideologies. And CEP Europe maintains offices in Brussels, London, and Berlin with expert uh, advisory board members located all over Europe. Um, since we were formed in Europe in 2015, we've partnered with the European Policy Center on many studies and events uh, since 
since that time. Uh, and we're delighted that we have an opportunity to develop this relationship and to draw on the experience and expertise of both of our organizations to really contribute to the wider understanding of extremism and terrorism, as well as hopefully identifying and proposing solutions, as is the case today. So the report, um, which Amanda has already alluded to, uh, was authored by Ian Atchison of the EP and Amanda uh, of EPC, Hiding in Plain Sight. Um, it is the latest collaboration of our two organizations, and uh, I think it really represents a very important insight into the phenomenon of how terrorist defenders are successfully deceiving uh, the professionals who are responsible for their care and rehabilitation. Uh, and it goes without saying that this is a really worrying trend, which has led, as Amanda has um, already pointed to, it has led to truly deadly and devastating outcomes. And it's something that my colleague Ian um, has really focused on over the past number of years. And um, I think it's fair to say uh, he was he was really uh, enthusiastic and keen to to um, to engage this in this research. Um, and to share his findings and those of Amanda with um, policymakers uh, across Europe and indeed beyond. So I'm really delighted to hand over to my colleague Ian, um, who is going to talk us through the findings of, of the report, his experiences, and uh, and of course, then we will look forward to hearing from our keynote speaker. So Ian, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lucinda, for that introduction. And thank you, Amanda, for being an excellent collaborator in this piece of work. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. And, and thanks so much for, for joining us uh, across Europe as we launch our discussion paper, Hiding in Plain Sight. We have much to uh, discuss about this fraught and complex facet of terrorist behavior. So I'm, I'm actually not going to delay proceedings for too long. Those of you uh, who know me will be uh, surprised to hear this before we hand over to our expert witnesses uh, and, uh, and uh, Olivier, uh, and uh, who we're very privileged to, to have with us this afternoon to give some context and some practical reality and perhaps some challenge to some of the uh, conclusions and recommendations that uh, we came up with. But a few words of uh, context are probably necessary by way of introduction. So as a former prison uh, officer and prison governor, I've always been fascinated by deception. Frontline prison staff are always having the wool pulled over their eyes by prisoners who want some small advantage in a world constrained by what they would see as petty rules and physical confinement. Unfortunately, the art of uh, deception is not uh, simply confined to an extra meal or, or a, an extra trip to the gymnasium. Organized crime, that uh, dominates the illicit drugs market, certainly in English prisons, uh, relies on people in place to uh, secure the supply chain. So conditioning of uh, staff and deception plays a key role in keeping people in place in order to facilitate that. But the most worrying manifestation of this phenomenon of all, and obviously what we're here to, to, to speak about this afternoon, is when terrorist prisoners deceive the systems and the processes and people monitoring and managing their risk into believing that they have given up violence when uh, the precise opposite is, is true. And as the report details across Europe from London to Vienna and, uh, and beyond, um, disguised compliance opens up opportunities for terrorist defenders to strike again with catastrophic effect. So what is this problem exactly and, and what more can be done? Well, we've defined several uh, issues in the way terrorist prisoners are currently treated, or worse still, I might say, are left alone, that uh, during that crucial period of custody and community supervision after release, when the resources of the ingenuity uh, and the ingenuity of the, the state can most easily be brought to bear on assisting offenders to uh, genuinely abandon violence. And of course, prison is the one place for all its its uh, sins and all its difficulties, where we know we've got people uh, in place where we can actually work with them to tackle some of these, these dangerous inclinations. Um, so some of the problems we, we came up with, I'm not going to rehearse the whole paper because you have it in front of you, but in essence, we looked at fractured risk management processes, uh, intelligence shared by multiple agencies handing off to each other at different stages in the, uh, in the terrorists' journey, stifles information sharing, misses key behavioral changes and, and bakes in uh, 
uh, inconsistency that determined and deceptive terrorists can easily exploit. Generic one-size-fits-all psychosocial de-radicalization programs delivered by people who are often a moral universe away from the uh, subjects that they're trying to, to assist is a very poor substitute, we believe, for individualized uh, treatment according to uh, specific uh, pathologies. And that specified approach, we think, would also be very much harder to game than uh, the crude tick box brief encounters between therapist and subject that uh, unfortunately uh, we, we see being used uh, as the key ways of, of currently intervening and breaking uh, the, the radicalized uh, prisoner's mindset. The lone caseworker, uh, a strictly therapeutic and collaborative model of working with terrorists and, and the studied neutrality that sometimes uh, comes along with this, we, we think makes conditioning and, and deception uh, much more likely. And even when terrorists are judged to be actively dangerous on intelligence, we think that progressive groupthink within prison authorities can seriously impair judgments and let violent extremists have access to new targets. So on that last point, I'd just like to read you the, the comments made by the coroner at the inquest of the uh, Islamist terrorist Usman Khan, who you've heard a little bit about earlier, and most of you will know was shot dead by police on London Bridge in November in 2019 after murdering two young people at a rehabilitation event. The inquest jury described naivety and incompetence by a bewildering collection of protective services that was built around this individual to be in quote, seriously deficient at almost every level. And the, the coroner said recently, and I'm quoting him here, the facts of this case show the value of being alert to instances of significant dishonesty in self-presentation by terrorist offenders. I am aware that similar instances of dishonesty were seen in the case of the Streatham Hill attacker, Sudesh Aman. And I'm afraid it is sadly a perfect illustration of what we are dealing with here. Huge amounts of intelligence in this case and psychological screening were basically ignored by professionals who were far too ready to believe this man at the face value that he presented. He became what the council for his victims called a poster boy for, rehabil for rehabilitation on the basis of, of an entirely fabricated uh, backstory. And as a consequence, key information failed to be passed on or properly understood between the prison and the multi-agency public protection group that inherited his risk management after he left the prison gates. If there was ever a case of a determined and lethally dangerous terrorist hiding in plain sight, it is Usman Khan. And the fact that this same deception was an element in, subsequent, in a subsequent knife rampage in a London suburb some few weeks later by another released terrorist is not a coincidence in my view. It is yet another uh, symptom of a risk management system that we have in the United Kingdom that I believe is broken beyond repair. So if we consider that a small subset of uh, terrorist offenders are both skilled at manipulation and ideologically impervious to those crude efforts I've described to get them to abandon their commitment to violence, this is a very dangerous population that can have profound consequences for uh, national security and also for the protection of our liberal democracies that's out of all proportion to the actual harm that they can cause. In our view, we cannot accept that deception by these spectacular few, as the criminologist Mark Ham calls them, is just a fact of life, that no more can be done. And there is, to coin an ugly phrase used by ministers that I know Jim Gamble will recognise uh, years ago in respect of Northern Irish terrorism, simply an acceptable level of violence. Now, we've made some bold and perhaps controversial recommendations that I'm hoping my colleagues are going to speak to during the course of this launch, and we will certainly return to. We don't claim, Amanda or I, to have all the right answers, and we must vigorously debate any actions that might uh, have the effect of doing the terrorist job for them by damaging the values of the liberal democracies that we are trying to protect by some of the uh, rules and, uh, and some of the innovations that we must uh, take up in order to, uh, to, to meet this challenge. But unlike those, I suppose, whose ideological purity exists to do us harm, we welcome dissent, argument, challenge, discussion. Because in the end, that is the only route to getting better uh, at dealing with lethally disruptive, sorry, lethally deceptive extremists, which we uh, very much need to do. 
So thank you and back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Ian, for this very succinct and uh, um, clear presentation um, of our paper and the goals of the paper and the thinking um, behind it. Um, I'd like now to immediately give the floor to um, Olivier uh, Onidi um, to hear his you know, thoughts, having, having had the paper and read the paper um, and how our recommendations um, fit into the work that, I mean, the European Commission stroke EU um, is possibly doing um, on this topic as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for, for, for this, uh, for the invitation, but uh, more importantly also for uh, the work that you have uh, collectively done, uh, with uh, special thanks, of course, to Lucinda and Ian as well, uh, uh, including for the, the wonderful summary of, uh, of the, the report that uh, you have just produced. I'm not sure I would characterize uh, uh, my uh, intervention or contribution here as a keynote uh, uh, speech, but, but rather maybe uh, strong, strong words of encouragement uh, for uh, the very type of work that uh, you have just uh, conducted. I think overall, when looking at uh, the different uh, uh, steps that we've taken uh, uh, on uh, terrorism in the EU, uh, we've done a lot uh, uh, in terms of uh, curbing uh, uh, the means, actually, that radicalized individuals, that terrorists uh, had to actually commit a terrorist uh, acts. But more importantly, and with the very strong support of all member states, uh, uh, we have also engaged into something which is uh, uh, way more demanding, especially for uh, a set of organization that is uh, uh, more traditionally inclined to produce legislation uh, to actually work on uh, the prevention and uh, uh, countering violent extremism, i.e. Uh, work on uh, uh, radicalization uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the EU and, and beyond. And I must say, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is of prime importance because this is basically the source of uh, uh, the different terrorist acts. Uh, and we know uh, that terrorism uh, is uh, still a very high threat in the EU. We also know that uh, uh, looking at uh, the very uh, the, the, the recent past, uh, uh, that uh, terrorists uh, uh, do not need sophisticated means uh, to hurt, nor actually sophisticated means uh, to uh, become radicalized. Uh, there, there is ample uh, engagement, ample invitations uh, around us uh, in order to actually seize opportunities of uh, vulnerable individuals to actually uh, proceed uh, uh, and uh, commit a horrendous uh, uh, act of, uh, of terrorism. When looking at uh, um, the various uh, uh, steps and, and progress that we've made at, uh, at EU level in terms of preventing and uh, uh, on the radicalization front, I think we've, uh, with, the, with of course, uh, the support through what we call the Radicalization Awareness Network, the support of some 6,000 uh, practitioners, many, uh, you know, academics, uh, a uh, fantastic uh, set of uh, civil society organizations uh, and also the authorities uh, that have built up all over in the EU, we've come to quite a sophisticated uh, uh, common understanding of uh, the different paths to radicalization, meaning that uh, all uh, of uh, uh, all the segments of society are much better equipped these days to actually uh, uh, device, decide, uh, detect uh, signs uh, of uh, radicalizations and hence be in a capacity also to act uh, at an early stage be be before the person is, uh, is actually ready to commit a, a terrorist act. The second, uh, uh, I would say, big achievement, especially in an area as diverse as the EU, has been uh, also quite uh, a sophisticated understanding of the different forms of ideologies. Hmm? Uh, we started uh, very, very simple terms, uh, looking only at the jihadism uh, uh, ideology. Uh, we've, uh, we've extended that, and uh, I'm quite comfortable to say that these days, uh, we actually have developed competence and expertise across the different range uh, of different ideologies, 
to a point where uh, people come from all over the world to talk to our specialists, our experts, etc., in order to further nurture, further understand those uh, forms uh, of uh, ide ideologies. We've also managed, uh, as the third, I think, very important uh, step forward, managed to put together everywhere, in every European jurisdiction, major and very successful program of prevention. And because of that, uh, your subject is even more important. <laughs> it is important uh, because uh, uh, the, very the, the very aspect of rehabilitation is still, of course, uh, the, the aspect, rehabilitation, de-radicalization of individual, the aspect we are struggling with. Uh, we see we still have difficulties. Uh, we, 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 we are unsure what uh, uh, forms of coercion uh, we need uh, to use, uh, uh, what uh, range also of uh, uh, expertise. And we do see in this field, uh, way more than in the others, uh, uh, our weaknesses. Huh? So, 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 so again, uh, your, uh, your point and, and, uh, and your subject is extremely precious uh, to, to us. Why? Because First thing is the fact that uh, we do have, uh, we come, we've come at a situation where uh, the numbers are quite high. I mean, the numbers of uh, individuals uh, who have been convicted for terrorism acts, uh, who are in prisons, who are leaving prisons, are very high. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of individuals uh, with some member states having like a, a huge concentration of uh, uh, such indiv individuals and uh, are a bit uh, in distress also to ensure proper follow-up of uh, uh, this uh, population. Second, uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, while the official rate of recidivism uh, is, is, is quite low, uh, it poses a major problem to us. The first is uh, no one is uh, certain about uh, how accurate these numbers are. Probably uh, the overall rate, uh, which is officially, uh, you know, estimated at between 1% and 3%, uh, is uh, slightly higher. But even more importantly, uh, and Ian uh, stressed that very much, uh, every case... <laughs> of uh, uh, what you call disguised compliance, every case of recidivism puts the entire effort of rehabilitation, the entire trust into what we have uh, built with a lot of, uh, of difficulties, a lot of energies, mobilizing major resources into question. Huh? Society doesn't have any acceptance for terrorist acts, but society uh, ha doesn't even have, uh, you know, uh, has even less acceptance for uh, recidivists, especially in that very uh, segment. So this is very, this is politically extremely difficult, and 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 hence again the importance of uh, uh, further uh, uh, drawing uh, uh, and under understanding the the phenomenon. Some some aspects, a few aspects, I wanted to to bring into uh, the uh, the discussion and in light with uh, uh, the very good report, but also in light of of a discussion we we actually just had this morning with the member states and uh, uh, also uh, players of the radicalization awareness network uh, in what we call the uh, radicalization steering board we have at uh, at EU level. Um, well, we had a, a discussion about, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this process of uh, uh, prison and exit strategies, the conditions of exits of prisons, and so on, which which is uh, not exclusively linked to your your subject, but but quite quite relevant for that. Uh, so a few a few uh, aspects. The first one is, uh, uh, I believe, that uh, we uh, should. Uh, uh, First, uh, uh, not try to reinvent constantly the, uh, uh, the wheel on uh, uh, risk assessment methodologies. A lot of discussion is actually concentrating on whether we have the right instruments uh, in order to properly assess the risk posed by individuals. I believe we have sufficient tools. The problem is uh, we do not have enough individuals who are capable uh, of using these tools in the proper way. So rather than investing more into reinventing those uh, risk assessment tools, 
let us concentrate in investing more resources into the chain of uh, uh, authorities, the chain of individuals who will actually be using these uh, uh, risk assessment tools in order to improve the overall uh, result at, uh, at the end of the uh, evaluation. The third, uh, the, the second aspect on uh, the rehabilitation uh, programs, first very important thing is that uh, we need to encourage our uh, political uh, uh, leaders to speak about it, uh, not to deny the fact that uh, we do have gaps. Uh, because if you raise the expectations of society to a level where oh, everything is fine, we do have the competence, it, it is even worse. So, so, so I think studies like yours are extremely precious in actually providing further objectivity and further qualifying what the exact degree of the problem is and where we should uh, center uh, our uh, interventions. Uh, another point is uh, uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, we need to adapt uh, our uh, work on uh, those uh, radicalized individuals to the growing diversity of the population that we have in front of us. It was, so to say, easy in the old days where we only had to deal, for example, with those returned foreign terrorist fighters quite, uh, uh, you know, a population we knew very well, given the, the spread of different ideologies, uh, uh, given the spread of different uh, uh, type of individuals, uh, uh, their different uh, uh, experience, etc. They're very, very important to continue diversifying our understanding uh, of the population we have in front of us. A lot of work has been uh, done uh, lately on middle-aged individuals. We had concentrated a lot on the youngsters. Uh, no, no, it's all, not only the youngsters who, who pose uh, problems. A lot of work has been done also on uh, women uh, recently because all of a sudden we uh, also uh, uh, so so uh, the uh, potential of radicalization within women and also the, the specific way those uh, uh, women uh, have uh, are being uh, instrumentalized. Another point uh, uh, I believe is, uh, which is, is, is important is uh, to have a very systematic approach. And here, uh, in terms of systematic approach, what Ian uh, under, underlined very much, you need all competences to be mobilized. Uh, so so it, it's uh, to, to, to have a proper rehabilitation pass, you need all competences. You need to talk to all different authorities uh, from, you know, law enforcement, uh, uh, judicial, uh, uh, prisons, etc., with and the, the whole range of uh, uh, different uh, uh, competence in terms of education, health, etc. Very, very important to continue nurturing this and making sure that these professions actually talk uh, to uh, them uh, uh, the, the, across, across the lines of, uh, of, their, of their competence. And we need to continue investing immensely in providing support tools in order to facilitate uh, this joint work between different uh, uh, professionals, academia, researchers, uh, uh, etc., uh, making, uh, uh, make, getting really a communi community of uh, uh, a collective understanding of the issue and then uh, a collective group of individuals who are able to implement uh, the, uh, what, is, uh, what is needed. Another one, I think, is to further recognize our, the vulnerability we have with uh, the online world. Uh, I will, I will ne never stop saying this. We've taken uh, very bold measures in terms of uh, online radicalization. We've de deployed tools. We've invested fundamentally. But uh, it's, it is still a major point of vulnerability we have because just simply of uh, the universal outreach that the online world has and the, the total uh, also uh, privacy individuals enjoy within uh, this, uh, uh, this world. So a lot more uh, needs to, to, be, to be done on, uh, on this uh, uh, dimension. Use all different approaches. And I think uh, this is also a, 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 a very clear signal from uh, uh, your study. Uh, even though uh, these uh, schemes uh, or the appreciation is very different from one country to the other, we need all. <laughs> we need the lessons learned from all 
Hence, uh, also the uh, very uh, uh, more intense uh, work we're conducting, not only at EU level, but also with the Western Balkan, with the North African countries, in order to properly understand better the different uh, uh, tools being used and different phenomena that stem from these uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, invest more also in uh, uh, the investment in the, the uh, offenders' communities, another uh, important lesson. Uh, I mean, we need to penetrate the backyard of uh, uh, those uh, uh, individuals. It is only being uh, present through the parents, through the family, through uh, the, the, the close community uh, life of these individuals that we will have the means to outreach, to, of outreach, but also to detect uh, earlier signs uh, of uh, either deception or of, uh, of uh, radicalization. And for all these reasons, uh, uh, really a, a, an immense appreciation to uh, uh, organizations like, uh, like, like, like yours, to individuals uh, uh, like uh, uh, the ones that are represented here in this, uh, in this event uh, for your respective contribution. I, I think this report, uh, the, uh, also the actors behind uh, this report, are uh, fully integrated in uh, uh, some uh, of uh, uh, the uh, radicalization awareness network, uh, uh, you know, initiatives that, uh, that we have to continue to spread and uh, uh, help uh, ourselves. Uh, we cannot miss, uh, you know, this uh, challenge of rehabilitation because otherwise all the work we would have conducted uh, in uh, getting uh, individuals back on track uh, will will have uh, will have been uh, an, an, uh, you know an, a, a zero zero sum game so, so so to say so it's extremely important to provide proper objectivity of the size and the nature of the of the issue and then also uh, send a clear contribution as to the ways we can tackle this thank you thank you very much mr onidi this was a really wonderful um overview um, of what you've been doing in the priorities and the areas um, that are seen as being important. And actually, there was a lot of issues that you raised there that would be very good to come back um, onto during the discussion um, and the, the question session. And it's, it's, I think it's great that the work of the European Commission, the EU, is evolving. Um, and I know that a great deal is being done, including in RAN. I mean, RAN is very mm -hmm. important to think tanks. Um, the exchanges that, that take place there are crucial on this issue of prevention, um, right. among others. Um, so I'm sure we're going to have a, a further conversation in, in the discussion. Um, but I now want to move on um, and give the floor to, um, to Sir Mark um, to hear his views. I mean, you're somebody that's from the ground. I mean, you've been a practitioner um, on these issues for a long time. Um, so you're very familiar with the topic. So it's going to be very wonderful to hear your, you know, how you see our paper, um, where you see the key challenges and what more could be done. Schoolboy error didn't click the unmute button straight away. Um, thank you very much. And um, Ian and team, thank you very much for inviting me to take part. I think it's a really um, powerful um, piece of work and this sort of disguised compliance idea. Um, is a really, really important sort of contribution. I suppose where I'd come at this from is, I don't think our sort of Western liberal democratic approach to criminal justice has fully engaged with the idea that crimes motivated by a very, very powerful ideology are different. I think because the vast, vast majority of what our criminal justice systems deal with is um, classic crime by definition, um, that's its default cultural assumption. Um, and I think that's, even though different jurisdictions have had different amounts of terrorism, um, um, so before the last 10 years, maybe over the previous, um, 30 or 40 years, I mean, Britain's obviously had quite a bit. Um, Spain had some unique challenges. Germany did from time to time, Greece. So some countries have had some, some countries have had less. But there have been small pockets and there have been groups that are working in isolation to a particular agenda. 
And so whilst the risks are, have been high at certain stages, these have been quite delineated groups and the numbers of people being dealt with are quite small. We now have something with um, Islamist terrorism and also the growing threat of, uh, of, of the sort of right wing extremist um, sort of neo-Nazi, neo-fascist type terrorism. Um, we now have ideologies that through the power of the internet and other routes are becoming much more pervasive and much more widely adopted leading to a complete order of magnitude change in the number of people we need to worry about under that broad terrorist label. So you have that, I think, that these two dimensions, I think, come together. If you've got this default assumption of classic crime, not ideological, and then this greater volume, um, greater volume leading to interventions for more minor offences, which means people circle through the system quickly. You bring those things together, and it's exposed this risk. Um, I also think there's something that I think you've hinted at, but not spoken about, and it's it's really difficult to sort of, I know, falls rushing where angels fear to tread, and I'm going to try and go there. I think there is something about our sure-footedness of dealing with issues that touch on race and religion. Um, I, to, to, to illustrate this, um, there was a case 20 years ago in the UK um, a young um, girl called Victoria Columbia. And um, anybody who wants to read, I think it's section 17 of Lord Layman's report. He was a, a lord who did a public inquiry on the back of it. She was a girl, I think she was nine or 10. Um, she, she was sort of um, um, uh, um, black African heritage. Um, her, her sort of carers had some unusual beliefs and she died the most squalid and awful death when police and social services had multiple signs that the situation in this home was not right and didn't intervene. Um, and there was a whole lot of systemic issues, but there's a very carefully written chapter towards the end where Lord Laming looks at it. Um, and he says, and I've got a quote here, um, I found myself wondering whether a failure by a particular professional to take, a, take action to protect Victoria may have been partly due to that professional losing sight of the fact that her needs were the same as those of any other seven year old from whatever cultural background. So he was articulating a sense that there had been one of the factors in a failure to act was a nervousness when I don't quite understand this culture, so I'm gonna stand off it. Even though any objective assessment would say, the safety of a seven year, should be, a seven -year old should be irrelevant. Um, should be sort of agnostic to culture. This child is clearly at risk from all the behaviour she's showing. And so I think the criminal justice system has to be sure-footed in taking on, and I think it's particularly difficult with um, violent um, Islamist extremists. They're not representative of mainstream Islam. They've got nothing to do with what 99.9% um, .9 of Muslims think or believe or would ever do. Um, um, but they try to hide behind those beliefs and they try to use that to intimidate prison officers, probation officers, police officers, the whole system into acting. And I think that a lack of cultural confidence and sure footedness that actually it's right to take on dangerous behaviour, regardless of what ideology someone may hide behind, is a problem in this as well. So you add together this ideological thread, this volume, um, and some of this, I think, cultural lack of confidence. And you end up with a system that isn't aligned in the way that Ian um, describes. And I think it does take you into how do you, have we got the presumptions right for somebody who's coming out of prison? Uh, it seems to me there's almost a presumption that, of reform, almost a presumption of, of um, somebody wants to be a good citizen. Actually, if they've sort of sworn an allegiance to God that they believe killing lots of people is the right thing to do, then, then is that presumption right? Do we use the right technology? I think it's a really good point about being more intrusive about technology that Ian makes and um, the UK have started using lie detectors and I think there's more scope to take that further as you indicate. Um, I think the idea of dedicated specialist resources across the whole prevention and de-radicalisation system is important because you can't expect somebody in a local authority that has one or two cases a year to ever build up the expertise to be good at that. That's not a criticism of the individual. You have to build dedicated expertise. 
And lastly, um, the um, uh, point Olivier made about the distinction between prevention and de-radicalisation, I really agree with. There's lots of evidence that in the process of someone being radicalised, if you intervene early, you can pull them back from the brink and have a powerful effect. I've seen lots of evidence that in the UK and I've read about it elsewhere. It's different when somebody has signed up and got full membership and absolutely is 100% radicalised and believes in the cause and believes in 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 violence um, in the, for, to further the ideology. I've not seen any really powerful evidence, and and Rusi, I've been involved with some work they've done, of any scheme which has got a, a significant chance of success at dealing with that. And sort of, and I think that it undoubtedly is very hard. I'm sure one day we'll find better systems. But if we're always going to have a, it's always going to be problematic to turn somebody around who's absolutely sworn into an ideology. Then I do think this scepticism and supervision and dedication and resources the themes in your report are are absolutely essential so um look forward to continuing the debate thank you thank you very much um sir mark um without further ado i want to move straight to our next panelist because i'm keeping an eye on the clock here it's going by very quickly um so i want to give the floor now to you um gabby uh, tearson i mean obviously you're working um in a prison um, with uh, terrorist offenders um, on a on a daily basis, so I think you're very well placed um, to give us your your feedback on the paper, your observations, your recommendations. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you also, Ian, for this this very interesting paper. Uh, I think you mentioned a lot of, of valuable recommendation in it. Uh, I am not into it in everything because about um, legislation and stuff, I'm not an expert. Uh, but what I uh, found very interesting in your paper was uh, the factor authenticity, which is very important. Um, I think uh, the, the first question I had in my head is, but how do you then measure it and how do you rate it and, and um, uh, observe it? I think it's very difficult, especially when uh, prisoners are highly trained in manipulation. Uh, we had uh, people who came back, especially from ISIS, is my, my ID. Uh, they are trained how to behave in prison. Uh, they get a handbook. They are really uh, trained in it by, by people. Um, so it's difficult to distinguish what is like um, authenticity and what is like fate. Um, but still, I think it's, it's interesting. And uh, what I learned uh, from my work with, with terrorists, but also with, with uh, high leaders of mobster gangs, is that um, uh, the difference between the verbal and the nonverbal behavior on a very subtle uh, way of, of doing uh, is crucial. Uh, and for example, I had last week, I had a DTME which who asked me something and I said, no, I cannot stand behind it. I, I have other ideas about it. And I saw that his, his fingers were going to shake. Uh, and I said, yeah, maybe are you angry or are you disappointed in me? And he said, no, I'm totally fine with it. And then, yeah, I think like this is this is not like totally mix, mixed with each other. It's, it's a little bit strange. And I think these are very subtle things which we need to see. Uh, but which is also uh, difficult to, to recognize, I think, sometimes. Um, and another recommendation I saw is that the interventions uh, must be longer and more individualized. Uh, I think it's, this is completely true. I think you need to make a tailor-made intervention on every prisoner. Um, and uh, I think uh, it was, there was also something mentioned about the knowledge of a person biography, which is, is important to detect like who is someone, but also what is like not fitting in this profile. And um, I was thinking like what I know from our Dutch context is that we talk a lot about prisoners and we uh, read a lot of police files and everything. Uh, but sometimes it's um, difficult to talk with these guys. And I think uh, these guys themselves are a very important information point for us. And especially uh, people who try to manipulate, we can be manipulated by them, by being in contact with them. But if we are not very much in contact with them, we cannot see the discrepancies between uh, his story and, and the police information. And um, I think um, what already was said, I think by Oliver was that like, we do not need to discuss a lot about risk assessment tool. I totally agree. 
um, I think is bullshit. It doesn't matter that much which tool we use. Uh, but I think it's important that we have the good information source. So everything is based on good information. And then you can arrange to a risk assessment or to a structured professional judgment. But it's all about the information. And I think this is sometimes lacking uh, also in some European prisons. It's like in the Netherlands, we have a very luxury position. So uh, we have five prisoners, three guards. Uh, so we do cooking with them. We play games with them. We drink tea with them. And it all sounds very um, romantic almost. Uh, we do not this to entertain them or to, to please them. We do this because it, this gives us a lot of information about group dynamics, about uh, this guy himself, what are the teams which are in his head. Um, and we can see if there are discrepancies between what he is saying, what he is doing, what is in the police file. Uh, we try to uh, invite family and friends, for example, because these people do have also a lot of information about a person. And I think everything is, is into the information position uh, to make a good uh, risk assessment, but also to find these discrepancies which can give you um, an indication for manipulation. And um, I also think, like I, I heard you say, Ian, that, that some people are sometimes a little bit naive. I think this is true. I think there are people who think they can change the world and they really believe these, these beautiful stories of these guys. Um, I think we need to believe in change. Otherwise, I could not work, do my work anymore, I think. But I think when you work with people who can manipulate, you need also staff members who can manipulate and who know something about manipulation. So do not have a normal psychologist, but seek for a forensic psychologist. Seek for a forensic social worker, people who know about risk assessment and manipulation. Because this is the only thing we can do, I think, uh, if we work with people who can manipulate. Um, and I think uh, the last thing which I think it's very relevant is also to realize that radicalization occurs always in relationship to significant others and it's always outside prison. Uh, or sometimes it is in prison, but in our case, it's most of the time out of prison. And I think it's important to realize that behavior is not a very plastic type of thing. Behavioral patterns are shaped in social relationships and in the cognitions people have about them. And these are always fixed structures, especially when someone is 20 or 30 years old, they are already 20 or 30 years old behaving on a, on a certain type of way. Um, this will not mean that radicalization cannot go on, but the person is not totally different than a few years ago. So also, uh, changing this behavior is going very slowly. And it starts with very subtle changes in cognitions, very subtle changes in attitudes. And in the end, we have a, 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 like a discrepancy in, in the perception of the enemy. They change their vision of the enemy. But this is only in the end of the process. So I think it's important to keep this in mind that if people uh, change very quickly, it, it, it's almost too good to be true. Um, and I think that the whole thing is also that we need to realize that if we see behavior and a change of behavior, you see it in a, in a certain type of context. It's a very clinical type of context in a prison setting. And this does, does not mean that if someone goes back into his old uh, environment with his old uh, social relationships, uh, that this behavior will also uh, stay the same. So. We need, to, we need to have this knowledge about behavior and behavioral patterns. And you need to take it in mind when you work with these guys. Um, so I think this, this were the most important things that I uh, thought about. Um, yeah, and I found it a very interesting paper. I think there is a lot of um, uh, underlighted still, but yeah, I hope it will change uh, uh, with this discussion paper of you. Thank you, Gabby. I I'm just wondering if you have any examples of people you've worked with that have actually gone back into normal life successfully. Yeah, we have one. Yeah, we have a, a few, but we have one which I, I am very proud of. Um, it, was a, it was a girl who um, went into prison. She was very radical Muslim. Um, uh, she was, uh, how's it called? Um, 
she was before she was a Christian uh, person and she was very into the Christianity and later she turned to a Muslim and then she became very Muslim and very radical also in it. Um, and in the end, it was funny, she left prison and she had a lot of issues, not psychological issues, but ju just issues in her life with her, her parents, with her child. And we did a lot of system therapy uh, because we could not understand the behavior of this girl. It was very extreme. And she was a very smart girl. She was highly intelligent, uh, studying psychology also. So <laughs> when you look to the title, I was a little bit laughing at that, oh gosh. But this girl uh, went back into society. And uh, what we thought uh, went out, we, we had a risk um, scenario where we said, like, if you are going to be disappointed again into society, this is going to be a risk for you. And she got disappointed, of course, because she could not get a job. Um, and then she called us as a prison and she said, like, I do not trust anyone, but I trust you guys. Can you do anything for me? And we, we, we tried to help her to find a job. In the end, she found a job. Now she's a manager of a very high technical uh, company in the Netherlands. Uh, and she's not radical anymore. And she needed this to get attention for, from her family and from her environment. And now she is into her role of a mother and as a, as a member of the team where she's working in. And now she's totally happy. Uh, and it's now, I think, four years ago. Uh, and she's functioning yeah, very good. So sometimes we have these types of stories. We see them more with the women than with the men. Um, and on the other hand, we also have very sad stories of people we coming back and, and a lot of issues. So yeah, we have both. Thank you. It's good to know that some of these cases have that have positive endings because you don't always hear that many um, stories of, of positive endings, only the, only the negative ones. Um, so thank you. Um, I now want to give the floor over to, um, to Jim Gamble um, to hear his um, views on our conclusions and recommendations and, um, and if he has any ideas of what, what more could fit into this. Um, and after Jim, I'm going to turn back to Ian to have his feedback on what he's heard. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay, Amanda? Just to test. Thank you. Okay, well, my background, I've been involved in three principal areas. Uh, Counterterrorism, I was head of counterterrorism in Belfast during what we referred to as the Troubles. Uh, then Deputy Director General of the National Crime Squad, squad dealing with serious and organized crime out of London. And then more recently, uh, dealing with child abuse through the different roles I've had. And I think as Gabby touched upon, I think it's important that there's always hope that you know, you're doing what you're doing and it can make a difference. I think my experience uh, would be somewhat similar in the sense that I do believe sometimes you have a greater opportunity uh, with women uh, looking, seeking for uh, redemption about things that have happened and young people have no academic uh, or empirical evidence to support that. But, but that's what I think. Um, I, I'm also in, in the same place as, as Mark Rowley. I think terrorist crime driven by ideology is very, very different. And if you're wanting to get someone who has committed those types of crimes uh, to change, they have to face up to the horror of what they and their family and friends have done in, North, in the Northern Ireland context. You see now we, we are fighting over versions of the past because some people even now who were involved in some of the most awful crimes, uh, if they remove the veneer of their cause and their ideology, it's very hard for them to face up to the horror uh, of, of what they've done. And I don't think that that is unique to terrorist crime, but I think there are very few other crimes that match that. Uh, and one of the crimes I do think that matches it, and, and we're in, and I've had a number of very interesting conversations, is that this is similar, but not identical, but similar to sex offenders, especially those people who are involved in offences that create such stigma uh, against children. The thing that, that I've found about those people involved in those type of offences uh, is, if you've ever watched the TV programme House, Dr Gregory House has a philosophy that everyone lies. And I think... Those involved uh, who you know, have been involved in terrorism for some time or those uh, who are driven by behavior in sex crimes, uh, the first lie and the best lie they tell is to themselves. That's how they're able to seduce uh, so many other people. They minimize, they self-justify, and they blame others. You see that all the time in encounter terrorism. I was in a discussion recently with 
a young woman involved in in supplying as a quartermaster a uh, weapon a, a device which was used in a horrific incident uh, and she minimized by saying look i was only the quartermaster she self-justified as they do i only joined up after witnessing these terrible things that the state did and she blamed others if i had known the team that were going to do that were, were attacking that target i wouldn't have given it to them so so i think th those are important things and i think they're, they're well reflected in some of the tactics that, that are highlighted in this in children's social care, dealing with those that abuse children, you see that superficial compliance that the paper talks about. These people know the system, they learn and adapt to keep professionals at arm's length. You know, they're the people that can never make the appointment. They try and squeeze you into their schedule so they're controlling it. And one of the issues that I've seen very recently, and I've seen it frequently, is where that person, uh, the, the potential offender, um, pushes a divide between multi-agency professionals. You see it a lot in health and social care where they try and create a situation uh, where they can divide and, and, and influence through control. And um, these are the people that when you want to, to really test who they are, you're never able to cross the threshold of their home and strip away the veneer. So as Mark alluded to Lord Laming, I think another interesting thing Lord Laming said in his update report after the death of baby Peter Connolly it was about the need to be professionally curious. If your gut tells you it's wrong, that intuition uh, that we talk about in the paper, and you need to ask those difficult questions and you need to be prepared to challenge. Ultimately, I think you need to go look. The biggest danger uh, that, that I see is hubris. And whether it's going into a school in the aftermath of everyone's invited to look at you know, behaviors that are clearly misogynistic and, and how they've been incubated, fertilized, and, and, and develop. If you go somewhere, they say we haven't got a problem, then you have a problem. But hubris can also manifest itself in, in, in another way. I was part of a debate in the Loudoun uh, Centre some time ago, where a, a clinician told me with great pride, this person came to me, and they admitted that they had an issue with downloading indecent images, they knew they needed help. And I said, well, I bet you I can identify exactly when that person came to you. And, and you said, well, that wouldn't be possible. And I said, well, I, I believe they came to you in, in 2000, between 2001 and 2003. And of course they had. Why? Because law enforcement had begun uh, to, to get some traction. They had infiltrated a, an online site where they'd captured the details of many people, an operation called Operation Or, who were downloading child abuse images. So this offender was getting his defense in first by seeking out medical help and saying, I know it's not right, I, I want to do it. And, and the problem when you take these kind of offenders and you give them the accelerant, the tool that the, the online environment can be around grooming and radicalization is that they're able to identify the isolated, the alienated, they give them the gift of friendship and they open up pathways to harm. So they're able to use social media as an accelerant to network, to engage and control. And of course, the high, the anonymity that provides for them is, is, is fantastic. And what they're able to do is when they engage, they simply find a mutual interest that develops rapport, that feels like friendship, and they're able then to steer their relationships. And I think, you know, coming to a close, because I know you haven't got a lot of time uh, for, for this, but there's a difference between rehabilitation and offender management. And I think we tip towards rehabilitation all the time, and people like to think that you can rehabilitate others. Uh, that's not been my experience. I think you can manage and mitigate the threat that others represent. But if you believe in rehabilitation, as, as a recent academic said to me that I, you know, he identified the fact, and I accept that, that I am a cynic. And when it comes to sex offenders, they can be rehabilitated. My view on that is when that person uh, meets a sex offender, rehabilitates them, and rehabilitates them to the point that they'll let them look after their own children, uh, for a long weekend, then I'll believe they believe in, in rehabilitation. So being seen to do the right thing and, you know, disguise compliance, it's impossible to know if you're actually rehabilitating anyone. You can't have measurements that show you're managing them. And I think what you need to do is use integrity testing, setting up scenarios where you test the hypothesis that a person is in fact now much more kind of improved and using polygraph testing uh, and vast BAST is the validated automated uh, screening technology that is very like polygraph, but the person doesn't speak. So it measures their physiological response 
on the basis of when they see the question. So much harder uh, to lie to. So I think this paper is an excellent step. I think there's lots of good work going on. Uh, and, and thank you very much for allowing me to, to participate in this discussion. No, thank you very much, Jim, for joining us today. I mean, it's a great honor to have your expertise here with us. Um, and thanks for these, you know, as usual, very great insights onto this topic. Now, I want to give the floor back to Ian now so he can respond um, to what he has heard. And then we'll take a, a question or two from the floor. Thanks very much, uh, Amanda. I, I genuinely say this. I, I think we are so privileged to have the expertise that we've heard uh, just in the last uh, 45 minutes or so uh, ar around this, this really complex and sensitive topic. And we're, we're, you know, I've made pages and pages of notes, which I'm now going to try to summarise uh, as succinctly as I, I can. But just some of the themes that I was hearing coming through. Olivier, you uh, said very powerfully and eloquently, I, I think, that politicians need to be able to talk about these issues. They need to be able to tackle the difficult underlying uh, issues around uh, uh, disguised compliance, around professionals perhaps being uh, manipulated uh, in terms of, we've heard it mentioned also, how race and ethnicity seems to, to interact with, with all of these problems. But I, I do sense, and I think Mark, you alluded to this as well, that we do have a kind of institute, what I would call an institutional timidity around confronting some of the um, uncomfortable truths uh, about the terrorist threat that we face. And actually it doesn't do society any good at all. Uh, and I'm speaking specifically, I suppose, about the, um, what I see is, is a race to equivalency between, in our country, Islamist extremism and far-right neo-fascist uh, extremism. I don't deny that those exist. I don't deny at all uh, the, the dangers and the lethality that extreme right-wing uh, ideologies pose, but they, are, um, they bear no relationship in ter terms of lethality and potency and body count, if you want me to be blunt about it, than Islamist extremism. That seems to be a truth that we are finding increasingly difficult to, to speak out about. And if we don't speak out about it, the danger is we become complacent and distracted uh, from, from the actual threat at hand. Um, uh, Gabby, I, I think it was absolutely fascinating hearing from, from a... Uh, a, a practitioner uh, who, who's worked uh, close up and personal with some very dangerous people. Um, I, I liked what you'd said, uh, and I absolutely agree with it, that we have to start thinking about these prisoners as intelligence sources and as our encounters with these prisoners as a, as a way, you know, a unique way of gaining more information about how they operate, about the group dynamics that you've mentioned and so on. Uh, and I think that's the only way, incidentally, we can build effective interventions and therapies to be able to wean these people off this commitment to violent extremism. And that in itself relies on what I think you and I both agree on, Gabby, which is a much more long term, much more in-depth, much more consistent management of terrorist offenders from conviction right through to community reintegration resettlement. Now, of course, that's going to be much more expensive frankly, than the, the generic approaches that we have at the minute. But when you consider the damage that individuals can cause, even, even in a small number of casualties, if they commit attacks and how devastated society and community morale can be, uh, and, and then you know, what security reaction that then can, can stimulate in response, I, I think it's really important to invest some money in, in a more long-term uh, uh, engagement. I think, Mark, sorry, I'm just jumping around here, but I, I heard you say something that I, I obviously completely agree with as well. And that is that we've got a sort of classical response from the criminal justice system to very different and very special types of offenders, to terrorist offenders. And, and I think, you know, we, our, our eyes come off the ball slightly about these people are different. I think one of the problems, and Jim will, will, will understand this probably more than anybody else in the, in the room, is that uh, there was all sorts of problems in Northern Ireland with treating terrorist prisoners as a separate category. Uh, but actually that was handled historically very badly where it, where it seemed to give credence to their, uh, their, their ideas that they were political prisoners. But we do have to, I think, separate uh, acquisition for, for gain and all the sort of classic uh, power uh, uh, dynamics that operate around uh, offending um, 
that isn't terrorist or ideologically motivated and, and be very different in our response and be very measured and considerate uh, in that. Um, Jim, I, I was really interested in you bringing up the, the importance of hope. And I think that's really important in terms of um, how we construct regimes for terrorist defenders. And Gabby, you, you may be aware that I visited Vukt and the, uh, the, the terrorist prisoner unit back in 2015 when the government asked me to do an independent review in the UK of uh, extremism in prisons. And I was I built a lot of the recommendations around what I saw there, frankly, because I saw what you had, which was, you know, control over the built environment, control over relationships, um, you know, which were which were friendly, but but professional, uh, that that degree of interaction, which was then converted into intelligence, uh, you know, and so on. And I think, you know, we have to be um, more adept at doing that, certainly in the, in the UK and, and in other jurisdictions, I imagine, as well, uh, in, in constructing the right environment. So there is the possibility for hope. But then, you know, to, to um, uh, quote something else that you, you quoted, uh, Jim, the, uh, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, the first lie uh, and the best lie is the lie they tell to themselves. We also have to be incredibly sceptical uh, about Gabby, what you what you sort of uh, termed as the, the the overnight conversions of people, and we have to build systems and processes which were, are interrogating the authenticity of a commitment to uh, nonviolence at every stage. And actually, that's where the biographical um, information comes into play, where we are testing. Um, what people are saying now against where they've come from and what they were saying in the past. And also, I think absolutely, when you talked about the difference between verbal and nonverbal cues, and I think that's actually where, and uh, Jim, you've mentioned it, and Mark, you mentioned it as well, where other forms of assistive technology come into play. How can we harvest and use bio data, location data, uh, information from practitioners that have spent a long time working with offenders, particularly frontline practitioners like prison officers uh, uh, who spend huge amounts of time with these subjects, but are often airbrushed out of more abstract and academic uh, uh, solutions and interventions when they actually hold the key to how or if somebody has actually authentically changed. I mean, all of that is, is, uh, is, is really good stuff. And then finally, uh, uh, a couple of things, Jim, you, you raised the fascinating parallel uh, between uh, terrorist defending and, and child abuse. Uh, child abuse. I know you said it wasn't a perfect fit, and I, I, I agree with you, but I think there is a lot that we can learn, frankly, from professionals working in other areas dealing with uh, deception, particularly, and you, you've, you've mentioned um, Victoria Climbier and BBP, particularly having gone through the ordeal of having to, to change uh, the, the approach to, to um, you know, in response to you know, simple but devastating lapses in that professional curiosity that, that is so important to the, the, the cohort of people that we're dealing with as well. Uh, and, and finally, to cap it all, um, uh, you mentioned hubris. Uh, you know, I, I think this is very important too, particularly uh, with organizations uh, who are still licking their wounds in, in my country, in the UK, uh, following two, uh, two devastating um, inquest into a an abject failure of, of the protective services to to stop terrorists who are uh, you know hiding in plain sight i would say um i i think um we we do need to um encourage organizations to be more reflective uh, about some of these near misses they've had where terrorist prisoners have clearly concealed their intentions and gone on to do harm i i'm a strong proponent of having active non-executive directors inside these organizations who are, who are supposed to be the canaries in the mine, of having independent scrutiny uh, of protective services to make absolutely sure that they're making the right decisions, asking the right questions, and not subjected to that group think I, I referred to, uh, to, to earlier. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there, Amanda, otherwise there'd be no time for questions. But I do want to say again to all of you, thanks so much for your contributions. They are so valuable. And they've given us, uh, Amanda and I, a lot more uh, work to think about in the future. So thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Sorry, I just needed to put my microphone back on. Um, yeah, so I just want to pick up on a couple of the questions here. I mean, we have a question from Anne uh, Giocelli. 
um, who, who is asking, do you think we should also focus on using our knowledge in the manipulation processes leading to radicalization in order to counter manipulate those radicalized individuals? Um, I'm not sure who would like to pick up on that on that question. Maybe Sir Mark, does that appear? Oh, Jim, Jim's uh, his, or both of you. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I just missed the stats of just broke out of it there. Yes, sorry. Um, she's she's asking, um, should we also focus on using our knowledge in the manipulation processes leading to radicalization in order to counter manipulate those radicalized individuals? Wow, that's a hard question. Um, I, I'm saying I'm more optimistic about the, the processes already in place in terms of as people get radicalized, I think it's much easier to intervene at that, at that stage. But how you, if, if the question is more about can you use the same manipulation to de-radicalize someone, that's too sophisticated a psychological question for me. All I know is whatever we've tried so far hasn't worked. Okay. Um, Jim, any thoughts on that question as well? Yeah. I mean, I certainly can't deal with the, the psychological aspect. What I can say from, from an experience point of view, I think it, it's rather than counter manipulation, it's counter influence. It's how when you can identify the spaces and places that people occupy, how you can um, place uh, material you know, in front of them that's not necessarily obviously from you that will influence them. And as part of my role in Belfast, uh, I was responsible for recruiting informants. And, and that's you know, an important piece of work that's very often uh, demonized. But I think ultimately, um, to give you a very simple example, when you arrest someone in a riot situation, my brief to the riot teams was always, do not manhandle, do not use, you know, over, do, do, do not use a maximum amount of violence within the law or, or, or physical force within the law, use the minimum, because they will be expecting when brought in to be brutalized, they will expecting, they'll be expecting to be um, abused verbally. And when they come in and their experience is very different to that, it's about humanizing. And I, and I remember when two colleagues were murdered in Belfast and we had a tradition here where the senior police officer would roll out and, and would say these are dastardly deeds committed by, you know, using language of the Bible, committed by these awful um, excuses for human beings. And Ronnie Flanagan, Sir Ronnie Flanagan, uh, who was our chief constable and went on to be HMIC, he changed the nature of the influence by humanizing it. So he would go on and say, today, you know, you know, I'm really sorry to say, I've just come from John's home and from David's home, where I've left two widows. I've left four orphans. You know, he will never see his children again. These are ordinary people doing a difficult job. So that may not be the, the, the answer that you were seeking, but I think in a practical sense, it's how we influence people, we get them to, to prompt a prompt to conscience, so to speak, and provide them with alternative pathways. Thank you, Jim. Gabby, do you have any any um, thoughts on that topic? No, I think Jim explained very clearly. Okay, then I'm going to turn to the, the first question that we had here from Peter Fulweiler. Um, I think he's talking about the staffing, staffing numbers in prisons. I think he was actually referring to a, a point that was made by um, Olivier. I mean, if this, the staffing in prisons is, is insufficient um, to deal with um, the, the challenges there. I mean, probably as you're from a prison, that might, that might be a question for you, Gabby. I mean, you're, you, I think in the Netherlands, you don't have such a problem with staffing, but in some other countries, um, in Belgium, for example, you know, my home country, I think this is an issue. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. This morning we had a, a delegation from Jordan uh, and there a guy said like, yeah, but in our country, they don't even have beds in their cells. Like it's they laying on the floor. And then I thought like, oh my gosh, but if you if you have these type of circumstances in a prison, it's very hard to, to get this relationship and to see them as fully fledged humans. Because then, yeah, like sometimes it is an issue, but if you treat people like animal, then you get animal. I always say this and uh, I don't want to hurt anyone here. 
But yeah, this is, I think this is very problematic because if a government wants to de-radicalize people, you need to give them good circumstances. Otherwise you can talk with them what you want, but it's not possible. Um, and especially also with the staff, like if you have not enough staff to control the situation and to control these group dynamics, it's, it's becoming very difficult. Um, so I think it's important if you want to reduce risk that you you have enough people and, and sometimes that's not the reality, but yeah, I think it's it's one of the the yeah the things you need to de-radicalize people. Thank you. Um go ahead, Jim. Your hands up. Yeah, I think the, the lesson in prisons in Northern Ireland was one about balance and achieving the right balance. And that means having the right number. And, and not even having the right number, but deploying them in the right way. And I think what Gabby said is right. You want to consistently and persistently be introducing the human element, the, you know, that that don't right down to that meta engagement. And I think in Northern Ireland, one of our problems was through the fear factor, you know, a prison officer would go into a cell and their home address would be written on a wall uh, or the registration number of their car. Prison officers were withdrawn from the population, which meant that that population was able to maintain the, the terrorist structures that they had, the rank uh, structure that they had, and, and, and continue to incubate and fertilize the ideology that was there through the discipline. And, and it's, it's about, I think it's really important, and I think that the Netherlands system sounds really good, the, the ratios, but it is really important that balance is right and that you don't you know, surrender uh, your presence. But if you are present, that you're present as a human being and not as someone who is brutalizing or, or, or fitting the stereotype that young prisoners will definitely expect. Thank you, Jim. And I want to give the floor actually to my colleague, Jana uh, Mazuradze. Um, she should be there and she has a question. Uh, hello. Hi, thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you to our distinguished uh, panelists uh, for such an interesting discussion. I have uh, two questions. In fact, uh, my first question concerns about how the whole government and whole society approach can be used to detect uh, disguised compliance. Uh, how could the uh, local police and the communities cooperate to identify the threats coming from disguised compliance? And uh, my second question is about how could the technology and the AI be fully utilized to detect uh, um, disguised compliance uh, more accurately. Uh, for example, the polygraph, uh, if it could be updated, what could be the edit variables uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thanks, Jana. Um, maybe I can give the floor to you first, um, Sir Mark. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so um, in terms of the second point first, in terms of um, technology, I sort of, I know the lie detectors are used in America, but I'm aware now of technologies that are improving upon that original sort of lie detector technology model using different biometrics, et cetera. And I think some of them have even been used in, in sort of in British civil courts, which is the first time in, in our jurisdiction that's happened. So, so I think there's increased scope for technologies to, to get to something which is a defensible, at least to a civil standard approved, to a balance of probabilities. Um, a way of, of sort of getting underneath it. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of doing that. Um, in the UK, that experiment has started, but I think there's a long way, um, a long way to go with that. And, and if we are trying to test the fundamental question, has this person started to move away from a murderous ideology, then we do need to get inside the head sometime. I think there's a difference because there's, there's, I suppose the argument against this, people would say there's a thought police argument. Um, I don't think that is too problematic in this case for people who have been convicted. I think a sort of lie detector, thought police type approach to people with no convictions has all sorts of other questions one would want to ask, and I'm less confident about that. But we've convicted somebody of a terrorist offence. We're trying to work out whether they're safe to release or safe to reduce the controls around. That seems, um, um, seems perfectly sensible. In terms of whole society, it's something I've been speaking about for a few years, the role of the whole society approach. I think, um, I think it has a general benefit in terms of the radar for spotting radicalization and poor behavior. And certainly on my watch in um, the counter-terrorism world, 
um, some of the plot, 20 odd plots we foiled on my watch. Some of them would come from very sensitive surveillance techniques directed internationally to, to the sources of terrorism, perhaps out in Syria. But some of those plot disruptions came because of a, a neighbor or a, a contact of somebody who saw something that concerned them and had sufficient trust in local police to pick up the phone to them. So I think there is evidence the whole society approach can make a difference. I think it is part of the, it's part of the radar, but I do think fundamentally when someone is so determined that they are going down this route of I'm going to disguise my real views in order to get into a position where I can kill people, that um, I think the technology trying to get into somebody's beliefs and that I think you've got it very close to somebody to have a strong system that we can rely on. Thank you, Sir Mark. Um, Jim, would you like to comment on that question as well? Yeah, I, I think twofold. The first one, how can government's approach uh, be used to um, identify disguise compliance? Well, I think I would change the question slightly because it would suit me to say, how can government's approach be changed to reduce the number of individuals against whom you, you are targeting disguise compliance? So, for example, in the UK, disproportionality is an issue. If you want to begin to change the context of the environment within which you work, it's about recognizing that it's okay to be angry and it's okay to protest, but it's not okay to break the law or use violence. And, and the more legitimate the government is, the more honest uh, the government is and, and the greater levels of integrity that are reflected. And I won't pass a commentary on what I think uh, about that. But the more that happens, the more that is seen, the more legitimacy you have and the more likely you are to get people to help you. Ultimately, I think when we're dealing with, with radicalization, we need to differentiate, differentiate between mental health uh, and that individual that has been radicalized through an ideology, not someone who's isolated and alienated and simply wants to belong. Because many of these attacks which utilize uh, or, or weaponize weapons, which you can find in, in kitchens or elsewhere, I think there's a lot more work to be done on that. And I think the Metropolitan Police uh, have led the field in that. When it comes to technology, we hear about malware. We know there's technology when we're combating child abuse where we can identify known images uh, being downloaded to particular IP addresses. I think we need to begin reverse engineering that. We need to, if we, if we have a suspicion uh, with regards to someone who we think, well, who claims to have been rehabilitated, then I think there's legitimacy in looking at how we integrity test that by accessing their IP address, by looking, because it's very difficult to hide your digital footprint and if you overlay that digital footprint against what you're doing and polygraph testing has been in, in use in the UK since 2008 and when we piloted it at first it's used very successfully I think against sex offenders and it can be adapted but it's about the entire context and practicing what you preach yourself when it comes to ethical government engaging with young people and giving them pathways to hope and, and then applying the tactics and techniques that, that any society should be able to, to apply to keep their citizens safe. Thank you, Jim. And I'll give the floor to you now, Gabby. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's very uh, difficult discussion. <laughs> I am not really into it because I only work in a prison setting. Um, but I think it's important to involve as much people as possible and to in involve society and to involve like the, in the Netherlands we try, it's, it's not that easy, but we try to have key figures in, in society so that you, you have a little bit an information position, but also a little bit of connection with these guys. Um, but I think it's very important and I, I am really pro artificial intelligence. So I am also very curious about what, what the future will bring us with this. Um, I'm also a little bit scared of it, but yeah, uh, I think it, it will bring uh, new advantages with it also. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give the floor back to you now, Ian, as we only have a couple of minutes left to, to, to wrap up, if you have any final um, thoughts on what you've just heard from the questions, etc. Thank you, thank you, Amanda. And I will be um, very brief. Um, these have been very interesting questions, and again, uh, lots of of detail coming out in the the answers that we've heard. I just want to seize on one of the things that was talked about. I think it was Jim, you you, you talked about um, 
uh, well, I, I'm going to widen the issue out of psychological and developmental impairment and that relationship with uh, violent uh, offending. I, I think Olivier said at the start that prevention is hugely more important than dealing with the aftermath and disguise compliance and all the rest of it. Uh, but within prevention, we have a bit of a blind spot, I think, and that is talking uh, sensibly and clearly and sensitively but again, comes back to the institutional timidity not to talk about difficult things, to speak about this relationship between uh, mental illness and violent offending. I, I often hear the, the argument uh, that rages back and forth about, uh, you know, for example, if, if uh, they, the, there was an offender, uh, I think very recently, um, who, who was uh, attacking people on a German train, uh, and then the, the uh, authorities were very quick to say that that wasn't terrorist related, that person was suffering from uh, uh, psychological impairment. And of course, then the opposite reaction gets produced when people say, oh, you're just trying to hide this for convenience. And, and my reaction to all of this discourse and all of this uh, argy-bargy, for want of a better expression, is, but the people are still dead. So actually what we need to be looking at, particularly, I believe, in the, in the um, context of unaccompanied minor asylum seekers coming into this country. We've had two examples where uh, they have been suffering psychological illnesses, which has certainly played a role in their descent into radicalized behavior. Uh, I think we need to get mental health professionals much more involved in, uh, in screening processes further upstream of people uh, uh, committing attacks. And actually that um, experience, and that expertise will also help us greatly in working out when people are being authentic with us about their abandonment of a commitment to violence and when they aren't. But uh, just from me again, can I say a huge thank you to uh, everybody who's come and who's listened to this. I hope you've learned something. Please keep in touch with us if you've got any other views or ideas. Uh, and certainly our excellent speakers this afternoon who've taught me a great deal. Thank you very much to, to them. Amanda. Yeah, thank you to all of you. Thanks for the uh, for coming here, giving us your, your time actually, because I know you're all very uh, busy individuals. Um, and for contributing with um, wonderful ideas. And I look forward um, to staying in touch on, on this topic and others um, in this field. And um, have a very nice evening.